day. This is uh, the Institute for Black Male Studies. And as uh, usual, we're here to bring some relevant information uh, in regard to the lives of black males uh, to the fore. And today we have a guest that uh, is going to more than do that. Uh, we will be talking with Mr. Carnell Smith, the paternity coach, whose newest book is going to give black men options that uh, many of us have probably never reflected upon or knew much about. Even if you heard about some of the things that he's going to talk about through somebody, uh, you're about to get some straight information from the source about what exactly uh, black men are experiencing and the ways in which family court and even in many instances, uh, black women can impact black men's lives in ways that doesn't often make the news. So um, if we can, we're going to transfer in here. We got our good brother, Mr. Carnell Smith. If you wouldn't mind, introduce yourself, sir. Hey, Dr. Johnson. Thanks for the <laughs> intro. Glad to be on your show. I'm Carnell Smith, the paternity coach, and uh, I serve and support women, men, and families primarily trying to solve mysteries and questions about family identity. And then one of the ways I do that is, is really an area of using DNA, okay. DNA, the law and advocacy. Okay. And um, I've been doing this now over 20 years. I've actually worked as a legislative consultant. I've gotten laws uh, passed successfully in multiple States. Mm -hmm. We almost got it passed in Michigan, uh, but it's really, in the primary area of dealing with the issue called paternity fraud. Okay. Okay. Tell us a little bit about paternity fraud and, uh, and we'll transition from there into okay. looking at your, your book. Sure. Sure. And, and how did I find myself writing this book? Right. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Well, as you know, being a, being an educator and stuff that, that it is, it is proper and fitting that you define terms, make sure everybody's working on the same definition, right? right? So paternity fraud, paternity is a lawsuit usually brought by a mother or guardian of a child with the claim, notice I said claim, not proof, with the claim that a male, a man or boy caused her pregnancy. And that lawsuit is primarily brought to get financial resources in some form or fashion, whether it be child support, estate benefits. Sometimes that child can be the heir to an estate. Now, where the fraud comes in, fraud is with the knowing and willful concealment of material facts. So let me put it all together. Someone files a lawsuit against a man or a boy claiming he's the father of the child while they knowingly conceal the existence that a, of other paternity candidates, or they know for sure he's not the father of their kid. Okay, well let me let me let me back up a little because what I like to do is 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 find out about uh, you know the man you know I'm interviewing mm -hmm. and let the audience know. Uh, tell okay. us a little bit about where you're from. And okay. and right. and who Carnell, you know, uh, was uh, you know as a young man, and 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 what kinds of experiences really began mm. to shape the man we see today. Okay, all right. Well, Carnell Smith is a guy who is originally from Florida. Um, in my early years, um, I experienced uh, parent. Both my parents were very adamant that you leverage education as the great equalizer, meaning applying yourself, use your gift, talents, and abilities to the best of your abilities to use those opportunities with the education to open as many doors as possible. And whether those doors later lead into entrepreneurship, college graduation, et cetera. So during those early years, I found myself being bullied and victimized by my own people while I was trying to pursue educational excellence. I was in the gifted program um, as a middle schooler and then a high schooler. Uh, I graduated from college prep. Eventually, as I got taller and started lifting weights and stuff, and started working <laughs> out with the football team, the bullies sort of left me alone by something about being painful to, to, to have to mess with somebody who was willing to give it just like he was getting it. Mm. And uh, 
after the bullies left me alone, but I stayed committed to what my parents told me. They told me, our job is to get you to that classroom. Your job is to bring me some good grades. <laughs> okay. Right, right. So I am one of, uh, I have seven sisters, four brothers. Uh, a couple of them are deceased, but my father's been involved all of my life. Um, he was with me. He was actually a integral part of my life, even all the way up until uh, February of 2020, when he transitioned on as 85 years old, and he's no longer with us. Wow. Um, my mother was actually a valedictorian 4.0 graduate. Um, so I have numerous. My many of my sisters are graduates, etc. But that's kind of set the stage for me as I look for opportunities to, to pursue electronics and engineering. Mm. Um, I ended up coming to Atlanta to come to a university called DeVry University. Uh, I liked that so much and pursued it, and it gave me opportunities to eventually end up in the roles of what I do now, working in computer science, engineering, networking. And uh, I've been doing that for several, more than two decades. Okay. But... Over the course of my life, I ended up becoming a, a, a father of two. I have a son and a daughter. Son's married, U.S. Marine, three-time Iraqi combat vet. Mm. Daughter, she just uh, she is a senior now at Georgia State, so I've been involved in their lives um, pretty much all of their lives. Um, but before I got married, though, I had two problems I had, and both of them involved ex-girlfriends. One ex-fiance, I experienced par uh, parental alienation where you as a dad, you have your court paper say you're supposed to get to see your kid, mm. But, mm. But, but the mother won't let you see your kid in spite of what the court order says, and the court won't enforce the order that they sign. So now, that, now, that just out of, I'm just out of, out. now, just out of curiosity, what time frame are we in? What time period would you say that we're looking at? Oh, that was in the 80s. Mm, so, okay. so that was in the 80s that I experienced what it was like to be a victim of paternal, I'm sorry, parental alienation. And that led to becoming an erased parent. And then after the ex fiance moved to another state, man, that all but killed my relationship with my son. Wow. Um, and it's hard to fight a battle across two states when you got two states jurisdictions and you got to have an attorney in both states. And eventually the money ran out trying to do that. Mm -hmm. But the good thing is my son wanted to know about me for himself. So while his mom thought she was keeping keeping us apart, he searched for me and found my website and he wrote me and uh, he and I reconnected while she thought she was keeping us apart. So wow. we ended up seeing each other. Wow. Listen, the kid said, based on my mom's character, I knew there had to be more to the story than she was telling me. And mm. I wanted to talk to you for myself. Mm. Mm. Look, mic drop moment. Man. Do you, and and what what's blowing me away about that is how often I've heard that, you know what I mean? It Just today. It, what? It's still happening today. Oh yeah, yeah, man. There's tons of absolutely of people. yes, and 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 so sons are looking to find out the other side of the story, and yep. then when they find it out, especially yep. if they if they've reached adulthood, and they've mm -hmm. been with women, you, they realize that wait a minute, my mother is my mother to me. But yeah. she was his woman the way my, this woman yep. is my woman. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it really, yep. it, it's an important stage in a young man's life to really understand yeah. his father as a man exactly. and his and mother what, as a woman. And what kind of man is he? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, so, so please continue. A lot of black kids. Look, a lot of black kids and other kids and other races are not having a relationship with their fathers because they, there's this claim about so much so many of the kids are suffering from fatherlessness but i'm telling you a lot of these kids are suffering from not seeing their father because their mom yes. and their grandmom are trying to prove a point mm. because that man's no longer in a relationship with her she's going to do everything she ha can to nuke and destroy that relationship between him and the kid been there done that and i got the t-shirt okay mm. 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 
So, right. so tell us a little bit about, so, so we, 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 we kind of see how you were first experiencing parenthood. Tell us a little bit about what led up to this book. Now let's, let's, let's talk yes. a little bit about the book. Uh, okay. Tell the audience, you know, the, the, the name of the book, where they can find it. And we're going to cover that at the end too, but I want to give them multiple opportunities. Right. But uh, the tell us about The name of the it. book is Trapped by Law. Trapped by Law. How to Stop what? Stop Paying Child Support for Paternity Fraud. And the book comes out of my own experience where a former girlfriend contacted me several months after I broke up with her. Dr. Johnson, she said these words, these seven words that no man wants to hear from an ex-wife, an ex-girlfriend, or ex fiance these words are, I'm pregnant and you are the father. <sighs> like I said, that, ain't, look, that, is, that is not good news to him. But guess what? When I got that news, I said, well, um, congratulations. I hope you and your baby daddy be very happy. <laughs> but, but why are you calling me about this? I mean, I, I haven't seen you for months. You know, I look, I broke up with her on February 15th. So you know what that day is, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. You caught me off guard with that. <laughs> Obviously, February 15th is the day after Valentine's Day. <laughs> she says she said some things to me that got under my skin. And I said, well, you know what? <laughs> I don't have to take this. <laughs> So I tell you what, you go your way, mm -hmm. I'll go mine, mm -hmm. and I wish you well yeah. and goodbye. Yeah. But she contacts me, man. She dialed the wrong number. Look, if I was to illustrate this, look here, I'm holding this phone up, man. She dialed the wrong number. She called me instead of calling her baby's daddy, and convinced me that she got pregnant on February the 14th. Ooh, and it took me 11 years later after I paid child support, took care of the child, helped her out. Um, eventually, as I got married, I introduced the child to my family, uh, to my to the to the uh, to the daughter that I end up having with my wife. Child was an integral part of my life and family. And eventually. The mother, after 11 years, calls me up and she says, I was talking to my girlfriends and and you don't pay me enough child support. Mm. I'm like, what? Wow. What what do I care about what your girlfriends think? Mm. I'm like, look, I got I'm paying money into a college fund for the child. I'm paying money for a separate wardrobe for her at my house. I'm paying you direct child support without a court order. But she didn't want that. She wanted more. And this is right after she got married, bought her. Bought her a new house, new car, her and her husband, everybody balling. And I'm like, well, look, I don't think I can, the course going to make me pay more, do more than I'm already doing. I said, look at all the stuff I already do. She took me to court, sued me, and uh, they darn near awarded her $1,800 a month, which is about mm, close to 40% of my take-home pay. Now, now, and, now uh, what, what was it before that? What, what, yeah. Well, there was no court order. I was paying her like three seventy five. Wow. But but that did that look, that's not counting the like hundred and twenty five for the college fund plus the wardrobe and look, I she never had to give me anything. When the child was with me, I covered everything. Mm. If she mm. if the child needed some extra for activities and whatnot, all she had to do was let me know. Mm. But but that's what, but look, that's what's so sad about this. This is the kind of, um, these are the actions and the steps we want responsible men to do when we, when we want them to be active fathers. And even my own dad says, man, you got, you bring kids in the world, you take care of them. Mm -hmm. But even my father was stunned as we later found out that uh, my pastor's dad talked me into taking the DNA test and that DNA test revealed that she did have a baby, uh -huh. <laughs> but she, she didn't have my baby. Mm. So mm. here I am with a huge child support order 
that is more than my house payment. It's going to force me to become homeless because I work 60 hours a week. I'm on call 24 by 7. I can't work another job, Dr. Johnson. There's no more hours left in the day. You got to sleep sometime. You you feel me? I I definitely do. Let, let, let me pose this question to you too, though, because clearly this is a huge you know, financial issue. And with that, yes. there goes a great, a great deal of stress, uh, particularly yes. when you know this is not something that's necessarily needed. She, as you said, she was doing well. She's remarried. They're living well. Uh, this was just arbitrary. She did it because she could. Uh, yes. But, but my curiosity. And with the full backing of the court. Right. And, and that's precisely what one of the things I'm talking about, because when we look at the black family, one of the policies that impacted us the most, and really one could argue broke the, the black family starting in the 1970s was the impact of family court and the, the things yeah. they really began to do. Yeah. But the question I wanted to pose to you was mm -hmm. tell us what the impact was, uh, you know, emotionally as a man who's been raising a son mm -hmm. only to find out one day this is not yours. It's not your son. Well, in, in this case, for me, that was a little girl. Oh, I apologize. Okay. Yeah, no worries. No okay. problem. No problem. Go ahead. But so, so when I got the DNA test that day I was home, this news was horrible. Man, this was this was like having a child die in your arms because as I looked at that result saying zero for zero percent, what? Carnell Smith is excluded as the biological father of child XX. I mean, they have they named the child, but I never named her. In the shows and stuff that I do, this is you know it's not her fault. This this is this has everything to do with when moms are involved with multiple people during their window of conception. She can't tell you which guy is the baby's daddy, but in the actual facts, turns out she actually got pregnant six weeks after I broke up with her. Mm. That is not what she said. Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. I am definitely so, hearing you. Yes. She named she named the other guy in under 30 seconds, and turns out this other guy was in the adjacent state. She named that guy 11 years later in less than 30 seconds. Now, why did Carnell Smith get picked? I'm not entirely sure how that happened. You know, I had my own house, two cars, a side business, and I was an engineer. Engineer by day, DJ by the weekend with mm. eight crews of DJs working for me. I don't know how I got picked. Look, look at me. I don't know how I wow. got picked. Wow. Yeah. I can't tell you for sure yeah. how I made the list. Right. Okay. But it also but speaks to how much power uh, that, you know, women in particular have via family courts, you know, because she can, she can levy that power against, uh, you know, a man arbitrarily. Cause like you're saying, yes, she chose yes. you 11 years later, she could mm -hmm. run off the name of someone else, meaning yep. that, you know, she, she knew the possibilities, but she could pick yep. you and there didn't seem to be anything legally there to protect you and provide no. a window for there to be some kind of verification. Now, to my yep. understanding, you mm -hmm. you you took it to the court. Am I not? Am I incorrect? Yeah, you took yeah, it to the yeah. court so to say let's, this. Let's, this let's, is what we found. Unfolding this. So yeah. Uh, once I get the results here, and I I've and I you know I'm I'm in shock. I'm sad. I'm hurt, and I'm like, oh man, this is messed up. But then I, I thought about it. It's like there is no way she doesn't know that she was having unprotected relations with somebody else. It's not possible. If she wasn't under attack or anything of the sort, then there's no way she doesn't know she was involved with someone else. Mm. So I contact my attorney. I'm like, wait a minute. There's no sense in me continuing to pay this money for child support when this is for a pregnancy I didn't commit. DNA proves I didn't commit this pregnancy. And by facts that a child gets their DNA half from their mom and half from their, their father, then not, there's nothing in this relationship for me. And by the way, the mother has has interfered with me trying to see the child. I've had to, t had to call the police to try to exercise parenting time with the child. And then I find out the child is not mine. Mm. I am not going to keep fighting for, to see a child that I can't see that's not mine 
and go look and risk going to jail and prison for a very high child support order i want out of the court system and that's what i said to my lawyer he says listen you need you need to uh, share these results with her because i'm not willing to pay another dime so i sued her i sued her for fraud because the law the law says a knowing and willful concealment of a material fact constitutes fraud. Mm. So between me and her, only one of us knew she had been involved with someone else and that she really got pregnant six weeks after I broke up with her. Now, I didn't know that, and that's not the story that she told. You follow what I'm saying? Yes, sir. This was not a short-term relationship. We had dated for two and a half years until that moment she said some things to me that 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 led to us breaking up and I told her goodbye. Mm. You know, you go your way, I go mine. Mm. But as I get to the court, we uh file a lawsuit and the judge said it's my fault that I didn't find out sooner before I even knew anything about her being involved with somebody else. So the trial court refused to let me overturn that. So I appealed it to the state appellate court to the state Supreme Court. And and I also started lobbying for new legislation because I recognize that men and boys in this situation are trapped by law, Dr. Johnson. Yes, sir. Because yes, sir. Yes. it is extremely difficult that once an order has been placed with your name on it, it is, I ain't gonna say it's impossible, right? but it takes a major effort to extricate yourself out of this legal quagmire quicksand. Now, is it is it safe to say that the average African American man is probably not able to take it as far as you in terms of the cost of all of this? How how much did this cost for you to do all of this? That is a great question. That is a good question. So I took it beyond the state. Supreme Court, I took it to the United States Supreme Court, and I'm the only African American to ever take paternity fraud to the U.S. Supreme Court. And I gave proof that this has happened to over one million men and boys that we know about. Because I started, because I was lobbying for legislation, the law, the, the, the senators and the uh, state representatives told me, you need to get more data on how broad the problem is. So I contacted the lab that gave the test uh, that does the testing for the state of Georgia. And they said they regularly determine one out of three of the men that they test turn out to not be the dad. So in that calendar year back in 2000 something, um, they said they tested like 90,000 guys, roughly 33,000 of them turn out to not be the dads. So then I contacted um, uh, the organization that provides the accreditation for all of the labs who do legal parentage studies. That means the American Association of Blood Banks. And they publish an annual study. It used to be the paternity uh, exclusion study, but now it's called a relationship study. But the, the, the consistency is this, is that over 400,000 men and boys a year are tested to verify a relationship that somebody said he caused a pregnancy and over a hundred thousand of them per year turn out to not be the dads and that's nationwide in the united states we presented that data to the u.s supreme court with two constitutional arguments that one is that the court should not, the lower court should not have the power to enforce an order against me under the assumption that i was the biological father after everybody knows that I am not the biological father and that the mother has willingly and knowingly concealed material facts. In other words, she lied to me. She lied to the court. She may very well have lied to her own attorney. So took it to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court had two meetings about it. They found out I was lobbying for legislation. That legislation actually got passed in Georgia. And then they made me submit a supplemental brief and send them a copy of that law that passed. And then they sent me back a one line letter, Dr. Johnson, petition denied. And at a cost of over $250,000 for me to do all of these appeals, all of these record costs, transcriptions, recordings, 
and you have to put a you look you have to send a special booklet format to the United States Supreme Court to put your case together and you probably going to need some appellate level uh legal help and making sure you structure your arguments correctly cuz they will listen they will reject your appeal just based on the format that you send the, the wow, document in ridiculous ridiculous now i know uh, and i've reported on this on my online show the onyx report uh last year one of these testing centers in jamaica if i'm not if i if I remember correctly yeah, I and i'm pretty sure them. had over 70 percent higher over 70 percent and not J- jamaica and several countries in africa yes nigeria closer, mm-hmm. closer to 70 percent yes so this is far more this is far more common than most of us ha- have even dreamed of and yet yes, as sir. you point out this has not been codified in law men have not been give, given protections what do you think the reason there's is? There's no punishment. There's no punishment. And there's no for punishment. The mothers right. who do this. Right, paternity fraud. Yeah. But but Listen, but it's it's actually a common law fraud. We don't mm-hmm. even have to have a special criminal statute. Listen, if 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 you were to deceive someone into signing a contract while they were under the influence, whether it be drugs or some other substance, and and it later comes back out that you've exerted undue influence while this person was incapacitated and unable to to make a clear-headed decision in their best interest. You could undo that deal, okay? And and the fact that if you did it for a thousand dollars, you could you could very well get a prosecutor to pursue some criminal charges on the on the scale of larceny, grand larceny for that. But when it comes to paternity fraud, when women and girls lie about how who helped them get pregnant. We're not talking a thousand dollars now, uh, Dr. Johnson, because we're talking payments that increase generally every two to three years. And if the guy ever gets behind interest charges anywhere from six to to ten percent, we're talking on as much as seventy five thousand dollars to several million dollars over eighteen years. Man, this is better than robbing a bank. Look, why do people rob a bank? Because the money is there. Well, why do some people lie about who their child's father is? They do it for several reasons. And I talk about that in the book, but I think before we go any further, we need to talk about the four primary ways that men get caught in a paternity fraud trap. Well, okay, real quick, before you do, just wanted to find out what do you think the reason was that they denied you? They are not required to tell you. If you if they told you why you your appeal was rejected, then you could come back and file a motion for reconsideration to accommodate that argument. <laughs> In all three courts, they only sent me back a one-liner. And mind you, I found out on the grounds that I that I raised, there's no time limits to file on a matter of subject matter jurisdiction. Mm. There's no time limit on filing on the matter of your constitutional rights where you are essentially being made into a slave because you, you know, I'm 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 supposedly endowed with with, with the rights for liberty, you know, the pursuit of happiness, you know, all of those good things, but how am I being um, a freeborn citizen when I'm being forced under the barrel of a gun to surrender 40% of my take home pay under pay or go to jail? That ain't voluntary. You hear me? That is not willing and agreeing to because once I knew the facts, the day that I got those test results, I took actions with my legal team on the same day and according to the statutes in the state of Georgia, if you find a problem with the order within less than a year, you could petition the court to correct the matter. I found out within nine months of that that order that they, you know, they set my child support so high. But here's my opinion. Carnell's opinion is the reason that no one was willing to vacate these judgments. It would allow men, if it had been won at the state, um, at the U.S. Supreme Court, then men in all 50 states could have used my case as the controlling factor for them to win their cases, which is why I took it that high. My opinion, I didn't want anyone 
who was stuck and trapped in a paternity fraud situation to not be able to get out of it because they couldn't afford to put up $25,000 for a retainer just to get started. Mm. Cause that means the price of justice is too high. And that means a whole lot more men and boys would be trapped under law with no way out. Absolutely. And look, and because of the high court did that and went that route that left me with only one other option. Okay. And that meant we were going to have to change the laws state by state by state. See, I figured this out real quick early on that the slowest approach was going around doing it state by state. And, right. I, and I've lobbied, look, I've lobbied and worked with about 12 states. Mm. And I think we've got like nine or 10 of them passed. Wow. wow. And by the way, that law that passed in the state of Georgia, mm -hmm. I won as the first guy who used that law. <laughs> Poetic justice. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now you were about to break down four areas that yeah, you wanted yeah, yeah. people to know. There's four look, there's four primary ways that men and boys get trapped by law in paternity fraud. Number one, signing a paternity confession without proof. I'll I'll add some more to it. I'm gonna just run through them first, mm -hmm. okay? Number two, incorrect default judgment. Number three, marital presumption or marital assumption of paternity. Number four, mistaken identity without proof. So let's 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 break them down. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, the paternity signing the paternity confession without proof goes like this. Get that guy, that man or that boy, to come to the hospital and tell him how much. Ooh, that baby got your nose. Ooh, look, got those look, got those cheeks like you. Ooh, got that smile like you. Oh man, hold on, I'm, hold on. I'm looking for this. Um, I'm looking for this very special high powered instrument. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Sign here. You do want your baby to have a father, don't you? And oh, by the way, we don't disclose to you that the hospital people have a material interest in you signing that document because they make twenty to 50, twenty to a hundred dollars from everybody who signs up. So they're not operating in your best interest, and they have no motive and no incentive to tell you that if you sign this test and you not did I mean sign this confession, you will be trapped by law and potentially not be able to get out of this until after the child reaches the age of majority. Listen, people who rely on the look-alike tests are often fooled. Mm. And the reason I can prove that is, and by the way, I end up going into business with the lab who did my DNA test. I've done DNA tests nationwide, mm. in and out of the country for servicemen, for NFL players, for hip hop, R&B artists. Look, nobody is exempt, mm. okay? So that look-alike test is a very uh, telling thing to get that guy to sign a document which gives him legal responsibilities, but it doesn't give him any rights of fatherhood. So by signing that document, you give the, the state and county child support office the power and the authority to come after your money. They can come after your wallet, your paycheck, and get submit an income deduction, they can take your money so fast, your head will spin, and you won't know what happened. You get your paycheck, money's gone, and you're trying to figure out, well, wait a minute, this mistake's been made. And your HR department said, no, man, no mistake's been made. We had an income deduction order. Yeah. And if, if we didn't pay them, if we didn't take your money to pay it, then we would have had to pay it. Not and we're not paying for it. Okay? See, see, and that's interesting because the very first day I became a, a you know full time professor, my very first day, they had me to go, you know, go to these uh, the, the intro training, you know what I mean, to get you acclimated mm -hmm. to the thing. And one of the things, the, the things they told me as an incoming state professor, right, mm -hmm. was that we can take up to 100% of your check due to back child support. Now, at, you know, that wasn't something I was grappling with at the time. So it wasn't that yeah. it impacted me that way. It just blew me away to hear just so. Yeah. It, and they said it so matter of fact, like, you know, 
you can like, you basically like it was a no big deal. Yeah, you you can just keep coming to work for nothing, and a hundred percent of your check is gonna go over there, and and that's and you there was no kind of empathy, there was no and kind of no structure, no recourse, a, no support and system, you and you can't argue with your employer because they have a court order mm. that they have to comply with. So that net, that means if you signed that paternity, they call it, here's the cute names for it. Paternity acknowledgement. Mm. Paternity opportunity program. Woo. <laughs> Listen, I don't care what anybody tells you about the lookalike test. Look, if a mom dates three guys who look alike, there ain't no way she can tell you which guy is the child's father unless she was only involved with one of them during the 60 day window of conception oh my goodness but guess what since the law doesn't require her to tell you that there's three other people or 12 other people or as the highest i think i've seen is 20 20 people tested before they found the actual biological father and I've had t- child support agency uh, agents testify at legislative hearings that they regularly test six guys before they find a baby daddy. So if a guy has signed up, they don't have to do that step. And right now, Dr. Johnson, if you sign that paternity confession in the hospital or at the child support office, you may be waiving your right to a DNA test and the right to challenge that paternity later. Cause the first thing they will say in court is your honor. We gave him the paper. He had a chance to read it. Um, your honor, here's his signature. He's already agreed right. that he wouldn't challenge this later. Right. Right. No, nobody, nobody's gonna mention that part that, well, actually he didn't read it. We snowed him on how much that baby looked like him when the truth of the matter is that baby looked like Ray Ray. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Ooh. Ooh. So that's number one. Number two. Number two. Incorrect default judgment. In the state of Michigan, there's a there's a young man. He and I share the first name. His name is Carnell Alexander. He's all over the news. You can find him on my YouTube channel at Paternity Coach and several other news stories. He never signed up for paternity. But if you don't come to court on the day they have that hearing, the court can use this powerful instrument again. You see this right here? Uh, uh. With, with, with one of these, no matter what color it is, as long as it writes in blue or black ink, this is all it takes to make you be the father of a child you don't know from a woman you may not have ever touched. You might not even know her, okay? But if you don't show up to to vehemently protest and and demand a paternity test in writing, then their position is he's the dad and he's trying to skip out on his responsibility and the court will make you be the daddy because you didn't show up. Carnell Alexander, he didn't show up because he was incarcerated at the time. Wow. Now, if they could find anybody, they ought to be able to find somebody who was in the system. Right. That that tells you they didn't even look. Right. There was, they had no interest in doing so. Guess what? That brother didn't find out what happened to him from a former girl that he knew. She had to put somebody's name down for her to get child support. Know how I know that? She said so in the interview that I have on news video on the Paternity Coach YouTube channel. She said, I had to do what I had to do so me and my child could get our food stamps and welfare benefits. They want a name. They didn't say they want the daddy. They need a name. So she put him down. Now, see, you you just hit on the number one issue in regard to the relationship between welfare and family court that has impacted the black family. She is incentivized to do so. You know, not only now there are some incentivizations that have to do with profit. Like you were talking about earlier with the the young woman who knew how much money you were making and how successful you were. Uh, That's that's being incentivized for profit. But with poor women, they're incentivized Mm -hmm. for survival in many instances. And it has the same impact on men. 
and the state going to be your baby daddy. The state going to be. And look, all you got to do is point us to somebody and we going to collect from him. We going to reimburse ourselves. Look, I have a stepfather who lives right here in Fresno. He is Mm -hmm. in his 70s with cancer. Mm -hmm. He is Mm. still paying child support arrears for a stepbrother of mine who is one month younger than me. Mm-hmm. And here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. His ex-wife died mm-hmm. in the early 1990s. Yeah, but that court order doesn't die. Exactly. And exactly. It it doesn't die until you die, and they can come after the funds from your estate. And by the way, there may be some things he could do, but a huge chunk of that bill for him is the interest. And a lot of men don't know they have options. They could pursue getting the interest erased, which would which would be a huge reduction on that bill. You understand the, the principles of, of uh, compound interest, the rule of 72, yes. how essentially money doubles based on whatever the rate is. Mm. And and that has a huge impact on um, men who got assessed an unreasonable child support order to start with mm. based on money that he didn't make. So if you have, let me just go cite some examples because I, I I follow this as well because right. I'm I'm very interested in federal reform specifically in the Title Four D section, especially in the areas where that the Personal Work and Responsibility Act was signed in ninety six ninety eight by President Clinton. In this area here, men can be attributed for income and assessed for income at a level that they have never earned. I'm gonna give you an example. Let's say you have someone who has been incarcerated some portions of their life, and if they don't have a marketable skill, then it's going to be very challenging for them to be gainfully employed. I didn't say impossible. It's going to be a challenge, all right? Mm -hmm. But if the court assesses a child support order for him at 40 hours a week at $12 an hour and base the child support based on that, and he's never made that year after year after year, he instantly starts out in arrears behind, which means he would almost have to, what, 150%, 200% his income to catch up. You hear me? (laughs) To catch up. And, And for a lot of those guys, there's no legal way for him to try to catch up. So some of the guys end up reverting back to the things that got him incarcerated before. Absolutely. So recidivism yes. will end up being yes. an issue. Out of, out of necessity in many ways. And let me just quickly point out, according to an article that came out a couple years ago, David J. Pate, Associate Professor of Social Work at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, pointed out, mm-hmm. he said the government is, is owed $115 billion dollars in child support but 70 percent of that money is owed by americans who make less than ten thousand dollars a year which is exactly what i was talking about yes he had look he's had child support orders assessed against him at a rate for on money that he's never earned yes now that that's an injustice on its face but but what happens though the, the, the men and the boys who face that situation in family court have no legal representation. Mm-hmm. There's no legal representation available to him up until he reaches the point where he's about to go to jail on the criminal offense of child abandonment or for contempt. But, but that doesn't help him with knowing the right strategies and things that he needs to do on that child support. And then there's another thing, Dr. Johnson. Would you believe if I tell you that a lot of the men will fall for the emotional appeal and think that paying the higher amount of child support has something to do with how much he loves a child. And he will agree, listen, he will agree to a payment with the, with the thoughts that he's going to try to figure it out once he gets out the courtroom on what he's got to do to get his hustle on to make that money. Right. Right. That's a fatal mistake. Right. You hear what I'm telling you? That's a, Fatal error. Right. Uh, with my clients, I told them, I was like, listen, you got to get this clear in your head. How much you love the child and how much you pay the child's mother are two distinct, different things. Yes. How, one has nothing to do with the other. Yes. 
And in fact, the court will tell you how much you pay your child support don't have nothing to do with whether or not you get to see your kids. <laughs> now, they won't enforce, generally it's hard to get them to enforce your order to see the kids, but be 31 days late on them payments, we're going to introduce you to some bracelets. We're going to suspend your license. We'll take your car because if we catch you driving that car without a license, we'll impound your car. We'll seize your bank account. We seize your COVID relief money. We'll mm. seize your tax refund. Look, if your girlfriend or uh, your wife's money is mixed up in that bank account, we'll take her money too, and she'll have to fight to get it back filing an injured spouse claim. Am I making some sense here? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yes, so, sir. Look, and we, we ain't even got to the other two reasons for paternity fraud. We just talked about the incorrect default judgment. Listen, it is so easy for a mom to get a default judgment against you. All she has to do, look, I'm going to throw you in this. All someone has to do is go file a paternity lawsuit against you and put her address down as the address of record for you. So she's going to get the notice for court. You won't get the notice for court. And because you don't show up at that court hearing, Guess who finna be the dad? Hold on, let me get that powerful instrument again. You see this, Dr. Johnson? This all it takes to make Dr. Johnson the daddy of a kid he don't know from a woman he didn't touch. And he won't find, and look, and if you don't challenge that thing like in the first 30 days, so so what if the child support agency delays sending in the income deduction order to your employer for three weeks? Ooh. So, so you still don't know nothing's going on. A decision has already been made that is not favorable to you. And you are past the point now you can actually appeal that decision that you didn't know nothing about. And on the fourth week, we file that income deduction order with your employer. And you know what you're going to get when you get your next paycheck? <laughs> it's going to be a jaw-dropping, mic drop moment. When you see that huge bite missing out your check, you'd be like, what you mean for child support? What, what you mean uh, deduction order? Hold on. I, who, this is a mistake. Like, no, it's not, sir. You, you one of those scoff laws, you know, trying to get out of your responsibilities. You know, you tell you what. Since you didn't show up, we're going to make you handle your responsibilities. That's what an inc incorrect default judgment can do. Now, add to that, that guy's not even a daddy. Right, right. Now, I want you I, to... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, and that's how it happens to our military men, too. Oh, man. That, mm. Now, I want you I want you to finish, but, All right. but, I, but what I ultimately want you to end on is... Mm what men can do and okay. especially in relation to your book all right okay finishing up with number three remember i said nobody's exempt so those first two things that signing up a, a paternity confession and an incorrect default judgment those apply to single men and boys this third one the marital presumption of paternity any children that your wife has while she's still married to you, whether you live together in the same state or the same country or not, they automatically yours. She know, look, she knows and the boyfriend knows that baby is his, but she's still legally married to you. They come after you for child support because she can't even put him on the birth certificate. And if they find out he's on the birth certificate, they will revoke that birth certificate and put the husband's name on it. On my YouTube channel, Paternity Coach, you're going to see quite a few married men, and they're not all black. Some of those men are pastors, engineers, scientists, professors, lawyers. Did you hear what I said? I'm listening. Oof. Number th That's number three. Number four, mistaken identity you could end up being signed up for child support because you have the same name as another guy. Wow. I had a client in Atlanta. The guy made a wrong turn. He went up a one-way street, and because he went up the one-way street, he met the police when he came back the other way. 
and there was a warrant for a guy who had a name similar to, not exactly, mm. similar to his name. That other guy had an arrest warrant for child abandonment for failure to pay child support. They took my client to jail for four days. <laughs> wow. And be and by the way, he was a cam- he was a cameraman for Tyler Perry. Oh, wow. And it and because he protested so much over the fact that they had the wrong guy, they started changing the information on the warrant to match him. I tracked that brother down, found him, got him an attorney. We went to court and we requested that the court bring the mother and the child because we know one way we could prove for sure whether or not our guy was the guy. Even though, look, even though our guy does not match the the warrant description, right? Our guy's like thirty pounds heavier, like five inches shorter, uh. and has no tattoos, and is very light complexed. Wow. You see the, you see the amount of melanation, melanin, uh, melanin in my skin. He was much, much less than this. Okay. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh. The, the warrant description of the guy who was supposed to be the father, six foot tall, like 150 pounds, skinnier, taller, has distinguishing tattoos, and he's as dark as me. I'm like, come on, man. Ray Charles could have seen that my guy wasn't the guy. But to humor the court, we insisted that my client get a DNA test. So I went there to court and I was prepared to provide the legal DNA services for him through my company. We were going to provide him, you know, in exchange for his testimonial because we could, we kept him from having to go back to jail again. I heard that. Because they had the mother picked up and brought to the courthouse, she sashays in and said, that ain't him. That ain't him. And they still, I say, well, we should still get the DNA test so my client can carry around a copy of this test so nobody else can make this mistake again. And they say, oh, all he's going to need is the court order. So they gave him a court order. The judge overturned it. And in my opinion, he should have sued for false arrest and false imprisonment. Because he had done nothing wrong more than a traffic violation. Wow. Listen, that ain't even the worst case. The worst case I've heard about is a child who was under 15 being ordered to pay child support for a kid who was over 18 because the kid had the same name as the father did. Mm. And, And they weren't going to overturn it even though the kid's mom was there in their face showing, look, I'm talking about the kid who was being ordered to pay. Right. He's younger than the kid they're trying to make him pay for. (laughs) But he has the same name as the father of that uh, young adult. No, 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 no. You got to say that again. Say it one more time. Say it slow. They were going to make a 15-year-old pay child support for an 18-year-old because he had the same name as that 18 year old's father. Clearly it was a mistake. Look, there's no there's no way that a 15 year old could have been the father of an 18 year old kid. Right. If it was, we should sell tickets to see this. It would be like the 10th wonder of the world, bring all the scientists out and the, and the geneticists and everybody, cause we finna make some money. <laughs> <laughs> but it shouldn't have even been able to get to that point. That's oh. exact. So the common sense rule. Look, we got to be that deep. The common sense rule should have said, "This is stupid." Right. And whatever idiot moron, whether it be in a robe or in the prosecutor's office or other, once you have the facts here, you got the birth certificate, and you can have the teenager in front of you and say. No, nah, there ain't no way he got an eighteen year old kid. But it listen, it took that young man's mother getting on television to tell about how they were treating her and how they weren't gonna fix it before before common sense and the light of day finally came in. They said, Oh, 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 this this was a mistake. But guess what? Child support mistakes are not that rare. But typically 
because with men and boys, especially of color, tend to not have legal representation and try to go in and handle it themselves without the knowledge and expertise of being a skilled pro se, pro per litigant. I'm not saying you can't learn to fight for yourself, but it's hard to fight for yourself while you go to jail and haven't learned the rules of the road. You with me? Yes, sir. So the, the important thing that I want people to know from my book is from Trap by Law is this has been going on for more than 20 years. And and this is probably more profitable than prostitution. Because <laughs> mm. mm. you don't go to jail for committing fraternity fraud. You can go to jail in some places for prostitution. But at least the prostitute's honest about, you know, what her terms are and what the situation is from what I heard, you know, what I heard. But with fraternity fraud, it's based on a lie. It's a lie that we can prove. And and my position is the easiest way to avoid this trap is to be aware that the trap exists. And you have to know what your options are so that you can make an informed decision at the right time. I'm a big supporter of DNA testing at birth. Mm. And I heard a woman who was the director for an American Child Support Enforcement Association. She said, Dr. Johnson, that it would not be fair to make a woman put her husband's name on the birth certificate mm. when her boyfriend is the father. Mm. I'll say that again. Please do. It would not be fair to the woman to make her put her husband's name down, who she doesn't live with right now, as the father of her boyfriend's baby. <sighs> <laughs> you, <laughs> goodness you, you gracious. listen to that you be like this man got to be kidding uh, there's no jokes here and there's no see and what you're pointing out is there's no incentive for women to no. be honest and there's no there's nothing systemically designed to protect innocent men from nope. being put in this category even with and boys I mean, it, and, and boys, and boys. Called yes teams. listen teen boys your yes. team yes. can get look can be bamboozled into signing that document. Yeah. He can't sign anything else that's legally enforceable as a minor, but let him sign a fraternity confession, and they now have access to your money as the alleged grandparent. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I, I was about to, I, on automatic, I was about to press pause and go out and talk to my son real quick. You almost, I had to stop myself. I'm going to wait because we almost done. So I just had to stop myself. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I will say this, you know, one of the things that uh, we've been developing in the last year is a black male political agenda. And, mm -hmm. and, and on the blog that I have, newblackmasculinities.wordpress.com, we created this list of political issues that black men have advocated mm -hmm. for. The first mm -hmm. thing on the list, now we didn't number it necessarily in order of importance, but I will mm -hmm. say based on the number of people that were writing me, uh, family court reform came up Absolutely. as the number one issue um they the, the first thing they you know men the men were pushing for was mm -hmm. automatic 50 50 child custody but exactly the, but the second right now they start if you're a single dad you start at zero you start at zero yes and the, you may never get above that the the second thing they pushed for was mandatory paternity testing at birth that was the that was guess, the very next thing been saying that for over 20 years yes and by the way, go look up. I'm on the wiki page. Um, I've been saying this since 2000. Yes. And I've been attributed as being the guy promoting the term. Yes. 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 <laughs> you hear me? Yes. And I know and you caught a lot of flack and resistance and pushback yeah. for doing so. Uh, just yeah. really trying but to protect what? me. You got you to gotta stand firm on your convictions because yeah. Yeah. my look. I've been told that truth is timeless. Mm. So if the truth is good enough for her to be able to say, look, the child should be supported if that guy caused that pregnancy. Whether she lied to him about birth control, she told mm. him she was allergic to latex, all mm. of those stories, whatever it was, okay? But once a baby show up, the, the state's position is either the state gonna pay or you gonna pay. 
And when and if she drops your name in the hat, I can tell you no longer is gonna be the state. Wow. You gonna pay if we have to take it from you. See. And we look, and they're not above taking it from you. No, they're not. The the other issue that men have been pushing for is financial bo- abortion. Mm-hmm. You know now, they want to be able to opt. if she could drop the baby off at the firehouse firehouse in the first year he ought to be able to opt out because she made the unilateral decision yes to to a to to uh to get care I mean get pregnant to carry the term and he has no options after she says right I'm pregnant and you're the father absolutely Remember those seven words I said absolutely. No man wants to hear these words from an ex-wife, ex-girlfriend, ex-fiance. These are hundred thousand, one million dollar liability words. Now, now I'm I've been so stupefied because there were things that I wanted to say, uh, mm-hmm. information I wanted to put out, but you have me, <laughs> you have me blown away to such a degree I can't remember what I was going to say. I just <laughs> I'm just trying to get out here to talk to my son real quick, <laughs> but. I do want to make sure we covered the four areas. And the biggest thing I want you to do is be able to tell people what to do, yeah. uh, what, you know, getting your book um, and, and how yes. they can get in contact with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. So I hope people will see that my whole goal here and why I wrote the book is to inspire men, boys, and the women who love them to take action, to keep them out of jail because they go to jail and prison for a pregnancy that they didn't commit and we can prove he didn't commit it. So there are steps that you gotta take. You gotta get knowledge and wisdom on how to navigate your way through this family court matrix. Cause if you don't, you'll get caught in that thing and you might not get out. Cause it is possible that you can be ordered to pay child support for the rest of your natural life. Imagine doing that and find out that child's not yours. So my goal was to inspire people to also get involved with the le- with the legislative front because many people want me to come to their state to help them change the laws. But guess what? If I'm not a constituent in your state, I don't yield as much influence as you do over your own legislators. Now, can I provide legislative consulting? Yes. Can I provide a model, a draft model of legislation that has been successfully implemented and has survived the challenge at constitutional level at the state Supreme Court. Can I do that? Absolutely. So my book is inspire you to take action, learn the steps, learn what the traps are. I provide tips of who's at risk, what types of people with occupations are at a greater risk. I tell my story. And and because so many people heard that when I was trapped, they told me, man, there's nothing you could do about it. Mm. But my but my father, my father told me, says, man, you you might need some help, but you can't quit. Maybe you need to get you some help. You got to be willing to stand up, ask for help, and you got to get in there. You got to swing with all of what you're worth. But you might have to learn how to fight, though, before you get in there swinging, right? Mm. Okay? Mm. So the book is very helpful, and it's going to tell you about my story and how I got out. If I can get out, somebody else can get out. Maybe it has to change the law, but 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 you shouldn't have to spend a quarter of a million dollars like I did right. to get out. The mm. good news is I think by my own estimates, I've saved over $25 million of people having to pay because several of our clients have been able to recover 100% of their money plus interest. And some have even gotten emotional distress because this is a very emotional thing to be bamboozled, duped booed and tricked in supporting other men's kids that you would not have done so had you been fully informed. And some men have gone on and married somebody. Wow. Just because they said these words, I'm pregnant and you're the father. Oh. It's, it's a lie sometimes, man, but you can't know. You can't know all that you need to know. But that's why I, I offer my, my services as the paternity coach. The way you can find me on all social media is Paternity Coach. I'm I'm the Paternity Coach on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And my own website is carnellsmith.com. My book is available, Trap by Law is available on Amazon. It's available right now in ebook. You can get it immediately and be off reading the ebook. 
If you want the hardback <laughs> copy, you can get that too. And I have a limited number of copies that could be autographed. All right. If somebody wanted to reach out to me through my website, we could talk about that and, and send them an autographed copy. I was called a man for justice because I wasn't willing to give up. You know, those are impossible odds of when you lose at the U.S. Supreme Court. It's supposed to be over. But I'm a guy cut from a different kind of cloth. I had a dad who talked me into an incredible belief system that you got to work hard. You got to get you some help. You got to get in there and then you got to go for it. Because if you quit, you automatically lose. But if you get in there and go for it, what happens when you get it done? Imagine what it was like when I walked out of court a free man after a three-year fight and I was able to sing something like free at last, mm. free at last. Thank God Almighty, this brother is free at last. And they'll never, ever, you hear me? They'll never, ever catch me in the system again. See, mm. I know about those incorrect default judgments. Mm. I know about how people can put your name down. Right. I know how to fight that. Right. Well, look, man, I, I just want to thank you for taking the time to come over here to the Institute for Black Male Studies, talk to us, prepare men, give men options to let them know what can happen, what has yeah. happened, and how yeah. they can begin to protect themselves uh, no matter what stage in this they're in, even if it's not impacting them, buying the book and at least being aware of what can happen. Yeah. I really want to thank you for coming here to do that. And more than that, I want to thank you for taking the time to do this because you could you could have done like a lot of others have had to you could have just put your head down paid the bill and kept pushing until one day you were finally done but instead you actually turned it into something that other men can learn from and hopefully if we can push national policy i would mm -hmm. argue that your work would be the foundation of that so thank you i really appreciate thank you, that brother. thank you and i do i i am working with someone to to do some for reform at the federal level. I That's know right. exactly where we need to do some changes at the federal level. Mm -hmm. Imagine this, instead of the current federal incentives to separate fathers from kids, yes. how about make success metrics based on how many kids you help have frequent consistent contact with both sides of their family? Right, right. And they start out at a rebuttable presumption of 50-50. Right. Not start at zero. Right. And have to fight to get something. Exactly. Start even. Mm -hmm. What I'm... And how about this? Go ahead. And also make sure that no state could make a dime off of counting a paternity fraud judgment on the books. And, and my suggestion would be that for every dollar of a paternity judgment that they have, that they lose a hundred dollars for every paternity fraud case they got on the books. Yes. Can we say somebody be motivated to help yes. set some people free? Yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I, one thing I would like for you to do, if you can check uh, the blackmail political agenda, look it over, and if there's anything you want to add to it, I would greatly mm -hmm. appreciate that because really what I'm doing with that is I'm leaving it freely available for anyone. To, to get contact with so that we can start to push policy in the interest of black men. And it covers a wide range of issues, you know, a wide range of issues. It's not limited to any one area, but it okay. just deals with what impacts the lives of black males. So if you get a chance to look at that, you know, please look it over, shoot, shoot send any suggestions. Shoot me a link so it'll make it easy for me to get right to it, okay? No problem, no problem. Because I, 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 got a, I got a recording project that I got to do this weekend. <laughs> Uh, I installed a brand new digital uh, Behringer X32, and uh, let's just say it it doesn't run itself. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Understood. Well, thank you again, um, and uh, hold you. on right thank there. You, I'll be right back with you. So uh, here at the Institute for Black Male Studies, this is the kind of work we're doing. It looks into the lives of black men. We actually use research and empirical data to understand black men. And we move beyond conjecture, stereotype, and anecdotal stories and delve into the realities of black male life from an academic standpoint. So thank you for supporting the Institute. Uh, if you're watching this video, please make sure you've made a donation or at the very least that you've uh, signed your name into the subscription to the website so we can reach out to you and let you know about what's coming down the pipe. All right. So uh, thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon.